Welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 35. Today is Tuesday, May 29th, 2012. I'm your host, Christina Consolo. With me today is Jules. Hi, Christina. Hi. Hey, did you have your detector with you this weekend at all? I did not, um, but it is online at all times, so I do have stats from this weekend. Uh, we had a couple spikes. Um, but not too bad. Uh, 25 counts per minute was my spike this weekend. Yeah, I ran out of batteries on Saturday, and I never got any more. So I don't really know what was going on in this area. But I did see on Radiation Watch that Indianapolis had some spikes during the car race. Mm. San Bernardino, um, Oregon, was uh, pretty high this weekend, too. And someone from North Carolina had posted that there was about a 25% increase in their area uh, above their post-Fukushima baseline readings. Now, right now, there's something going on with Radiation Network. Um, it appears that they may have been hacked over the weekend. Only about half the stations are showing up. And one of the stations, Maine, is actually reading in the 40s, which is pretty high for that area. So hopefully they'll get that straightened out soon. Uh, Sherry Edwards, our uh, guest for today, may have been hacked as well. We cannot get a hold of her, so we are going to need to reschedule her, hopefully for Thursday. And I was really looking forward to talking to her, too, but uh, we'll, we'll just have to get her on another show. Uh, Christina, I just went out to Radiation Network. Yeah, and it looks like my meter is offline right now. So during the break, I'll go reboot, and we'll see what kind of numbers we get here. Okay. But, uh, the East Coast does look a little high. Yeah, just uh, in, in the last uh, week, I wanted to share some numbers again from the Radchick page. We reached 26,222 people by sharing posts. And on Mutation Watch, we reached uh, 3,400 people sharing mutation images, and there's been a, a bunch more uploaded to there. I'm um, seeing a decrease in the number of dandelion images posted because uh, the, the dandelions are actually going through um, the end of their growth season and now what seems to be getting posted a lot is daisies and pretty soon we'll start seeing some more vegetables watch your produce too a um, few people who have been checking that have a like a Soaks eco tester have emailed me that they've had to take produce back to their local stores and they were curious about whether or not they can post the name of the store if they come up with high readings. Um, I saw an article and I can't seem to find it right now that you could get in trouble for doing that um, if you post the name of the market where you purchased either mutated produce or had high readings so you may just want to give the area and, um, you know, your location and whether it was a chain or, uh, you know, like a, a vegetable stand, which we have a lot of those in my area in Michigan, instead of naming names just to make sure you don't get in trouble. And I encourage people to uh, videotape it, upload it to YouTube so that we can share it more widely. And I have a feeling, Jules, with some of the recent news stories that we've had over the last few days that this has been going a lot more mainstream oh i think so i mean with the stories about the tuna people are going to start to freak out now yeah fallout and fishtails um being posted from abc news bbc uh reuters and i have a couple of those stories up to share with you but i also wanted to go over earthquakes because there's something going on in italy this morning uh they had another big one here i think it was a five eight early this morning and since then um, there's been a four five in bulgaria and then these are all italy four seven in carpi four seven in cavazzo a five four in cavazzo a five one in moglia and that's just like within the last three hours and the big one that they had this morning uh the death toll on that is 15 people so far that was just reported on rt a lot of those structures in that area, because they're located near a fault that hasn't been seismically active or even monitored anymore, um, you know, the, the buildings don't have any kind of uh, earthquake standards. 
So uh, a lot of people are already staying in tents or sleeping outside from areas where they had earthquakes in the last week, week and a half there. Um, so Italy, Bulgaria, and then, of course, Japan. We had some quakes around Japan, too, this weekend. Also, Tonga had a big one, and Argentina. We talked about the Argentina quake last night on WTF because it was uh, close to 600 kilometers deep in the mantle. And I saw a few more quakes posted after that, one in Fiji and then another one in Argentina that were that deep as well. Yeah, I was going to mention that, Christina. After the show, I went out to USGS, and there were quite a number of them, not only in Fiji, but um, was it Tonga? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, and they were incredibly deep. They were like 500-plus kilometers, and I don't think I've ever seen them that deep before. I mean, I, I, I haven't paid a lot of really close attention, but I'm sure that if I had seen them that deep, it would have caught my attention. Yeah, we definitely seem to be picking up some activity along the, the Pacific Plate and about the only place that hasn't had a sizable earthquake is the United States. I don't have the Canadian monitors up. There are separate monitors for Canada, if anyone's interested. Uh, I believe it's Environment Canada, uh, where I pull the radar stream from, from the forecast. They also have their earthquake data, and that is not uh, put through any other feeds. So the only place that you can get it is if you go directly to those Canadian monitors. They have a nice seismic site, too, where you can look at graphs as well. So if you live in any of those areas, just, uh, you know, be prepared. Puerto Rico just had a 2.5. And, yes, yeah, some of them around Japan were pretty sizable, 5.2 and 5.3. And they are not occurring in that area where they had activity last week. They were actually in the plate just south of that. So we'll keep an eye on that situation. I haven't heard too much about Reactor 4, but where I am hearing about a meltdown is at the NRC. And this was published in Common Dreams Building Progressive Communities, Meltdown at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. The resignation last week of the chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission is another demonstration of the bankrupt basis of the NRC, Gregory Yasko repeatedly called for the NRC to apply lessons learned from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant disaster in Japan. And for that, the nuclear industry quite successfully went after him fiercely. The New York Times in an editorial over the weekend said that President Obama's choice to replace Yasko, Allison McFarland, will need to be as independent and aggressive as Dr. Yasko was. That misses the institutional point. The NRC was created in 1974 when Congress abolished the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission after deciding that the AEC's dual missions of promoting and at the same time regulating nuclear power were deemed a conflict of interest. The AEC was replaced by the NRC, which was to regulate nuclear power, and the Department of Energy was later formed to advocate for it. However, the same extreme pro-nuclear culture of the AEC continued on at the NRC. It has partnered with the DOE in promoting nuclear power. Indeed, in its more than 25 years, and and the NRC in its nearly 30 years, ever denied an application for a construction or operating license for a nuclear power plant anywhere or any time in the United States. The NRC is a rubber stamp for the nuclear industry. NRC stands for Nuclear Rubber Stamp Commission, says Kevin Camps of the organization Beyond Nuclear. And it isn't that Yasko opposed nuclear power. He was not anti-nuclear. He was pro-nuclear, but in a smart and considered way, says Christopher Payne, director of the nuclear program at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Since the Fukushima accident began last March 11th, Yasko, who is a Ph.D. in physics, had called on the NRC to recognize and incorporate in its own rules and actions the gravity of that catastrophe. As he declared, as his four fellow NRC members approved the construction of two nuclear plants in Georgia on February, the first okay for a nuclear power plant in the U.S. in years, he said, I cannot support issuing this license as if Fukushima had never happened. He is resigning and... Uh, 
Welcome back to Nuked Radio. We got cut off a little bit there. I was talking about Allison McFarland, Obama's uh, new appointee for the head of the NRC. She will have to be approved by the Senate. And I understand that she is a spent fuel specialist. So it will be interesting to see what road she takes in that position, provided that she is approved for that position. In other news, uh, Drew just sent us a link, too. Uh, they're looking for volunteers to assist in the tsunami cleanup efforts. This was published in South Oregon's news source, the Mail Tribune. May 29th, volunteers will play a big role in picking up debris from last year's tsunami in Japan when it starts hitting the beach in Oregon. They do it most of the time now, said Mike Zolstish, Emergency Response Director for the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. I would say the potential is they will be very involved in this cleanup. Hopefully they'll be provided with uh, hazmat suits and radiation detectors and dump trucks and cranes to pick this stuff up. I mean, some of this stuff is huge. There was actually a whole sawmill that got washed out to sea, and that's one of the first things that have shown up in Alaska are thousands of these logs. You know, and they're like telephone pole-sized. The nonprofit group Solve organizes two massive volunteer beach cleanups a year on the state's 362 miles of beach all of it public. Beach visitors pick up a lot, and beach rangers for the Oregon Department of Parks and Recreation constantly pick up big tanks, tires, milk jugs, water bottles, bits of plastic rope, and fishing nets. State and federal agencies and nonprofit groups meet Tuesday in Salem to start putting together a plan for dealing with the debris currently forecast to start washing up this winter. Solstice expects the plan to be ready this summer. So far, the big questions, how much is coming, what will it be, and when will it get here, remain unanswered, said Chris Havel, spokesman for the Parks and Recreation. There's not a lot of uncertainty about our capability to handle it. What is certain is that it's really going to be an unusual volume. Until they know more, no one has any idea how much it will cost the state, but it could add up quickly. Havel said Beverly Beach State Park already spends 35000 a year to dispose of beach trash. It's getting nibbled to death by ducks, and that's a big concern, said Havel. It's unlikely to be the big thing that ends up being costly. It's the constant stream of little things that will be costly. We can't put a number on that now. State Parks does not have a firm estimate on how much it collects, but has been noticing an increase in recent years. While Oregon is relying on NOAA to keep track of the debris, to let them know when it's coming and how much, there is not much federal money available to help state clean up efforts. The state can tap federal funds for oil and hazardous material cleanups, but that is not expected to make up much of the material. Even if it ends up being a small problem, we will have to be prepared as if it's going to be a larger problem just in case. And they also said, we're not going to wait for someone in authority to come out and do it. We in Oregon have a long tradition of taking care of our beaches. So I'm glad to see that they are taking an initiative. Um, but uh, there's going to have to be some OSHA and hazmat requirements that have to be looked at when you're exposing the public, whether they're volunteers or not, to this kind of material before we know exactly what's in it. So a lot of speculation, a lot of assumptions at this point. NHK released a story of Fukushima radiation still circling the globe. Levels, levels consistently rise and fall in a 40-day cycle. This is the first I've heard of this cycle. The CTBO also released a video of their simulation, uh, but it is only through the first two weeks of April. This was published May 28th. Japanese scientists say radioactive substances from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant may have been dispersed all around the globe in about 40 days. A research team led by Akira Watanabe, a Fukushima University professor and meteorologist, says the overall density is declining but continues to rise and fall alternately in a 40-day cycle. 
They say radioactive materials from the Fukushima plant fell to the ground in various parts of the world, carried by atmospheric airflows, and then gradually decreased. But this does not talk about the continued steam releases. It does not account for the increase in levels, especially of cesium, krypton, and xenon in Tokyo, especially after the first of the year when there may have been a problem with the spent fuel pool number four, losing water. And this does also does not take into account the radiation slick that's off the coast of Japan where a lot of the storms get generated out of and later hit North America. So keep this in mind, though, for people who are graphing or have the ability to graph, see if you have any cyclical type uh, changes in your graph readings based on a 40-day cycle. It be interesting to corroborate that. Also in NHK, government report says it's urgent that effects of radiation on human health be reduced. Experts need to investigate residents with negative health effects. Fallout is worrying people not only in Japan, but also around the world. This was published May 29th. A government report says a more solid system to decontaminate the fallout from the nuclear accident last year must quickly be put in place. It says the fallout is worrying people not only in Japan, but also around the world, so quickly reducing the effects it will have on human health and on the environment is an urgent task. To promote measures to reduce long-term exposure and low-dosage exposure, the report says the governments and experts should speak directly with residents and provide information about any negative health effects that they may be exposed to. And, of course, this should also be true in Canada and the U.S. and Europe. Scientific American had published back in December that Fukushima radiation could very well lead to negative health effects in the U.S. and Canada. But as far as I know, there is not any follow-up to that. Also hitting mainstream, and this was the big, big story that I saw posted everywhere. All 15 bluefish tuna samples off California had Fukushima radiation but these were from samples taken back in August of 2011. Stanford scientist says this year's fish are going to be really interesting. Low levels of radioactive cesium from Japan's Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident turned up in fish caught off California in 2011, researchers reported on Monday. Tissue samples taken from 15 bluefin caught in August, five months after the Fukushima meltdowns, all contained reactor byproducts. Neither thought they were likely to find any cesium at all, they said, and since the fish tested were born about a year before the disaster, this year's fish are going to be really interesting. They were fish born around the time of the accident. Those are the ones that are showing up in California right now. Those have been, for the most part, swimming around in those contaminated waters their whole lives. If any fish are found with dangerous levels of radioactive material in their tissue, it would be re our responsibility to report it right away. And this is coming from Stanford researchers. So I'm glad to see that it is getting some mainstream press. When we come back, we'll go over a couple more stories, and we will talk about some of the outbreaks we've been getting emails about and what, if any, connection they may have to Fukushima. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Welcome back to Nuked Radio. Now, this was in ABC News on their medical unit page, how Fukushima may show up in your sushi. Before you swear off your nigiri, it's important to realize the levels of radiation the researchers found, talking about the tuna, from the cesium were exceedingly low, about 30 times less than the amount of radiation given off by other common, naturally occurring elements in the tuna we eat. Well, they were not specific about where that 
radiation came from. Findings appeared Monday in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The findings should be reassuring to the public, said Timothy Jorgensen, Associate Professor of Radiation Medicine at Georgetown University, who was not involved with the study. As anticipated, the tuna contained only trace levels of radioactivity that originated from Japan. These levels amounted to only a small fraction of the naturally occurring radioactivity in the tuna and were too small to have any impact on public health. You know, that's really a statement that needs to be quantified depending on how much fish is in your diet, what other meat sources you're eating, and whether or not those meat sources contain radiation, which we know from Potter blog is possible. So something that we've promoted on here is eating lower on the food chain, eating more plants, eating less meat. If you eat meat usually two or three times a week, think about going down to once a week. Or I eat meat probably once or twice a month. Jules, do you eat meat? I do. We eat mostly chicken, though. And uh, we've been doing a lot of uh, quinoa for protein also, so that helps. But uh, we keep beef to a minimum, and we don't eat fish at all. Yeah, it is lower in chicken than it is in beef. But again, this, this statement isn't quantified at all. And again, we're looking at like the long-term effects, and they're not addressing children in this statement either. They're talking about adults. Now, I, don't, I, I haven't eaten sushi for a year, and I've been thinking about it. I miss it a lot. I used to eat it two or three times a week. Oof. Still, the fact that the researcher could, could trace this radioactive material back to its source in Japan could have implications for seafood monitoring methods in the future. Dr. Michael Harbutt, director of the Environmental Cancer Program at Wayne State University's Carmanos Cancer Institute in Detroit, agreed that the findings are no cause for panic, but he said that the findings in tuna and migratory food animals could carry this radioactive material so far across the ocean deserves consideration. In general, when you hear the word radiation at all, it's cause for some alarm, and I agree, always a cause for significant attention. We need to get some more physicians on board with this. And another thing that is not addressed is pregnant women and whether or not it's safe for them to be eating fish. And remember that these levels were from samples taken in August. We've had a considerable amount of time and, you know, a reactor that is basically an open conduit to the ocean, reactor one with its hole, pouring radioactive water into the ocean and who knows what else going on with the other reactors. I think that the appropriate government agencies have to appoint appropriately trained people to give the public an honest assessment, Harbutt said. Not something tailor-made for ignorance like this will definitely kill you or this poses absolutely no risk. We've gone too far in poisoning the world to settle for simple yes and no's like that. So again, this was in ABC News. BBC is also talking about public health hazard from fish arriving in California waters. They are saying maybe considerably more contaminated than radioactive tunas. And some of the professors that were interviewed said that they were stunned to find this radioactive signal in bluefish tuna. Tuna is a very large deep water fish and it was expected that it would be one of the last fish that this would be showing up in as far as a food source. Well, Christina, here's something yeah. interesting that uh, Jan Stokes just dropped me. Um, I don't see a date on here short of 2012, so it's from sometime this year, but apparently uh, Canada has a mass firing of ocean scientists going on right now. It says Canada is dismantling the nation's entire ocean contaminants program as part of a massive layoff at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. 
Among the scientists terminated are the ones who would have conducted landmark research about global pollutants for decades. Uh, Peter Ross, who is among the world's leading experts on marine mammals and contaminants. Gary Stern, a mercury expert who focuses on the Arctic. Uh, Michael LaBeouf, who studies the highly contaminated St. Lawrence belugas. And Michael Ikanumu, who researches flame retardants and other endocrine disrupting contaminants in salmon. Um, that's pretty disturbing. Yeah, I haven't heard that at all. So they're, they're having a complete overhaul of the department, or are they getting rid of the department? Yeah, it sounds like they are getting rid of the department. Wow. I guess there's no reason to worry about contaminants in the ocean for Canada, huh? Well, at the beginning of this, um, Dr. Bill Deagle had said that um, Canada had tested some of their fish just a few months after March, and they reported in salmon that they tested that there was radiation from Fukushima, but they did not say the amount, any anything about the levels, or they would not disclose where the fish were caught. And I'm pretty sure um, that was the same instance where they put a gag order on the scientists after they had um, spoken up about that. And now they weren't allowing them to talk at all. And now they're canning everybody. Yeah. That's just unbelievable. Oh, Thanks, John. This is going to be the, the age of the whistleblower, I'm hoping. Um, because that's sometimes the only way that we find out what's really going on within some of these departments and agencies and commissions. And that goes you know, not only for the U.S., but Canada and Europe as well. Now, Reuters was running a story as cesium remains dispersed throughout the water column from the surface to the ocean floor. And Jules, I don't know if you recall, but early on in the disaster, they had speculated that the radiation would sink to the bottom yes. of the ocean. And now that's not what is happening. In fact, the levels are staying the same as they were six months ago. And there should be some research coming out about not only that soon, but some of the fallout in rain. Um, Arne Gunderson had hinted that that would be an upcoming uh, research publication within the next few weeks, I'm hoping, uh, to give us an idea of what the true fallout risk is being measured and recorded. Um, and I'm assuming he's still working with a guy at Massachusetts Polytech. For some of that research, it says, unlike some other compounds, radioactive cesium does not quickly sink to the sea bottom, but remains dispersed in the water column from the surface to the ocean floor. Fish can swim right through it, ingesting it through their gills by taking in seawater or by eating organisms that have already taken it in, plankton and so forth. You know, what's interesting about that is one of the first animals that showed radiation were whales. There were six whales that were caught within two or three months. Fukushima happening, um, I believe a couple of them were washed up dead in China, Russia, and in Japan. And they all measured radioactivity. And, you know, at first you think, well, it's a huge animal. It shouldn't be there. But whales feed on plankton. And that's one of the first places where it's accumulated. So that was in Reuters. Now, something else that's being brought to a lot of people's attention is some of the tree damage that's occurring. I uploaded a video to YouTube this week just taking a drive through Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, documenting the red forest or what looks to be red forest syndrome that's occurring all over Michigan. We'll talk about that a little more when we come back. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Welcome back to Nukes Radio. You know, I just realized that that um, bumper is from Planet Terror, which was a zombie movie. 
And that was something that we wanted to talk about because I'm getting a lot of emails about that and the flesh-eating bacteria. But um, real quick on the Red Forest Syndrome, something that was widely observed around Chernobyl was that the pine trees, because they're notorious for uh, cesium uptake in soil, turned a ginger red color. And this was, of course, most profound the closer you got to the reactor. Uh, But it's something that I began noticing over here last May. In fact, right behind my house, I have a couple of these trees. They've been there 17 or 18 years, according to the neighbors, and they always looked fine. And now they've been turning red. And in fact, the squirrels that lived in that tree died. And some of the animals that frequent that area, too, Canadian geese and so forth. I had talked about that, but I took a ride through uh, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, last week and shot some video and what was interesting is that you know there's a lot of huge pine trees in this area some of them are 100 feet tall and again you're seeing complete death of some of these pine trees and and they're absolutely red uh some of them from top to bottom we stopped at a couple of trees checked them over for insect insect activity in fact if it's a pine tree beetle like what they have in the Pacific Northwest, you'll actually see tracks or these little tubes that they leave on the bark. There did not appear to be any insect activity that was unusual. And we took some soil samples, and we'll be sending those in. Um, But this is something that I've noticed across Michigan. I did put a a video on YouTube about it. I've had a lot of comments from people across the country saying they've noticed the exact same thing. And one thing that was um, also found in the 25 years of research that was done around Chernobyl is that fallout tends to occur in patches. It's called a leopard spot pattern. And when Nibiru Magic was on here, he likened it to a shotgun blast. And uh, part of that you can account for because of the electrical charge of the particles and their um, tendency to group together. They kind of fall in clumps. And that seems to be how these trees are affected. They'll be three or four or five trees all together that will be turning red. And, you know, that's something you would expect to see with insects, too. But, again, I didn't see any type of unusual insect activity around these. So you may want to check out that video. And all of these articles that we went over today can be found. um, Some of them I dropped in chat or on the Radchick page or Fukushima Facts. And please share them widely to get people's attention, especially since they're from mainstream sources. And I wanted to also share this article. I came across this last week, and we ran out of time before we could talk about it. Jules sent it to me again this morning. Major energy breakthrough, electricity generated from water. Leading academic and industry experts have validated Blacklight's new process that directly produces electric energy from the conversion of water vapor to a new, more stable form of hydrogen. And this is a very interesting theory. It's a fundamental breakthrough in clean energy technology. And, you know, I had a conversation last week with a pro-nuke geologist. And um, he and I were kind of going back and forth. He had talked to one of my daughters, and she said, suggested that I have a conversation with this guy. And, you know, I brought up with him free energy and, and the history of free energy and how, you know, researchers, whoever, you know, whoever promotes that idea always seem to get nuked or their funding gets stripped from them or their plants burn down their research facilities or like Eugene Maloff from MIT, they end up bludgeoned in their driveway. And he said to me, well, if energy was free, how are we going to make any money? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Isn't that what it all comes back to? It was kind of at that point that we just ended the conversation. You know, you can only go so far with it sometimes. Um, but, uh, yeah, one of the things we've been getting asked about is some of this, uh, these new stories that have come out lately, well, the, the most disturbing story probably in the past year was this, this guy that attacked another man in South Beach, Miami, Uh, I believe this was over the weekend, and uh, he seemed to be suffering from what witnesses and the police officers say was a zombie-like condition, which may be from some drugs that he ingested 
Um, they don't know they're going to do toxicology on this guy. They actually had to shoot him several times to get him off this man that he was attacking. That man is still alive in the hospital in extremely critical condition. Uh, but there's been, that was not the first case of this in Florida. Uh, there was another case, and I believe it was in the Miami area as well, of this same thing happening about a month ago. And a few weeks ago, there was a, uh, a medical um, uh, facility there that had contaminated a half a million dollar machine that was used on a man who had this prions disease, which I can never recall the name. It's like the mad cow disease. Yeah, it's People. mad cow, um, Krupsfeld Jacobs, or... Uh Bovine spongiform encephalopathy is what it's called in cows. But yeah, yeah the, the prions, um, they're malformed proteins, so they're not even like a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. You know, the, the proteins get folded in on themselves, and they kind of create these large holes in the brain. It's, it's really frightening. And up until recently, there was no way to even kill prions. I mean, with, with high heat sterilization, they still weren't dead. And there were warnings about getting surgeries and stuff because contamination from the blood could still be on the surgical implements. Well, this, um, this medical center had used this machine on a patient that turned out to have that disease. And it, they put the machine outside oh. of the building and somebody stole it. And it's it's possibly contaminated with, uh, you know, this, this guy. It didn't say if it underwent any decontamination before they threw it out, you know, if that was even possible. It seems it, it had to have been pretty significant for a hospital to throw away a half a million dollar machine. Um, but that machine is missing in, in the last few weeks, and they've had a couple of these cases. But not only that, which is more concerning, is this flesh-eating bacteria and there's been a few cases that have happened around the CDC in Georgia, but I saw a couple more. There was one in Florida of an elderly gentleman that died from it about two weeks ago. There was one, I believe, in Pennsylvania that was reported this weekend, too. And people have emailed me saying, is this you know, the radiation? Is it causing mutations? I mean, these, are, these diseases have always been around. In fact, I know people that have had both of these things in my area within the last 10 years. Um, you know, so I mean, it's it's not something to like panic about. We won't know for a long time what, if any, implications radiation could have with these particular diseases, or for that matter, core exit. I mean, core exit is a you know um, meant to eat oil, and now they're having you know some some skin problems coming up in people where the flesh is being eaten, whether it's the same type of flesh-eating bacteria that, that we've had or that we're, you know, have been exposed to in the past or we do have in soil and things like that. Um, I don't know they're, they're doing toxicology on all those things right now, but it is worthy to know that radiation can cause mutations of viruses and bacteria. And... Low-level radiation also attacks your immune system, so your body cannot fend these things off. Although with the mad cow, I don't think anything could fend that off anyway. No, I, I don't think. I think it's because it's a part of your body. I mean, it's not looking at it as a, as a foreign invader. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it's something that you're worried about, you know, it's, it's step up your mitigation, and, you know, and that goes for, you know, if your kids are playing outside in the dirt and they're going to come in and take a bath, you can put baking soda in the bath and help with some of the, the decontamination, just making sure that you're really clean, um, that you're, you know, everybody washes hands uh, in your household. And um, also another thing, too, and Jules, you had mentioned this, too, last year, like when you didn't open your windows after Fukushima and you were real strict about like wearing shoes in the house uh -huh. wearing shoes in the house is really bad because yeah, you still don't we still don't wear shoes in the house mm -hmm. um because you are bringing in anything that's on the ground on your shoes into the house and that was one of the things Arnie Gunderson had recommended for people in the Pacific Northwest is decontaminating their shoes and and leaving them outside the house if you have a garage that's great because you can leave all that stuff out there 
Um, I don't. We have like a little foyer, you know, where everybody comes in and, and takes their shoes off. And I just make sure that I vacuum and clean that area really well. Um, but the same thing goes for pets. And if you have pets that are rolling around in the dirt outside and then coming in your house, laying on your couch, laying on your kids' beds, you know, they're, they're bringing in some of that stuff too. Uh, so cleanliness is really important now more than ever. And uh, baking soda is safe to wash your pets in. And you can use a lint roller too on them when they come in from outside, which will remove some of their hair and help cut down on allergens. So we just need to be more vigilant about some of our, you know, cleanliness and the things that you would do to cut down on germs and sickness and flu. Uh, you want to try to apply here as well. So hopefully we will have Sherry Edwards on Thursday. And thank you, Jules. Thanks, everyone. Please stay safe. And we'll see you on Thursday.